Amen. If you will, open your Bibles with me to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. Sandra asked me to sing this morning, um, and uh, I do have a song, but I don't think I could get through it today, so maybe next Sunday. Uh, so I guess that's a warning to some of you. In a, uh, Matthew 12, Jesus Knows is the title of the sermon. We're just going to um, examine uh, closely a couple of verses, but I have a about six or seven verses that I'd like to share with you this morning. So if you found your place, uh, unless you're driving down the road and, and listening to us, uh, please stand to your feet as we honor uh, the reading of God's Word. Matthew 12, verses 24 uh, through 30 is our text uh, this morning. <clears throat> it seems like it's been six months since uh, since I've been in your, you guys' company. And uh, so... Uh, uh, I'm I'm thankful for the privilege to to get back in touch with you guys and worship with you and uh, for you folks watching us over the internet, um, thank you for tuning in. But I want to just let you know there is no substitute for corporate worship. There's no substitute for that. Uh, I, I do understand and know uh, this COVID is still out there and it's real. And it has many people in fear. And if you're fearful, then please worship with us from home. Uh, but if you can make it uh, into the house of God, uh, please don't let uh, the Internet or whatever substitute corporate worship. It's good to see y'all's face. I have my glasses on, so I have no excuse to, to say anything negative about you. You guys look good. So... Uh, uh, Matthew 12, 24 uh, through 30, the Bible says, Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts. That's verse 25, and that's where, where we're going to be looking at this morning. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought into desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand if satan cast out satan he is divided against himself how then will his kingdom stand and if i cast out demons by beelzebub by whom do your sons cast them out therefore they shall be your judges but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or, or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. Think about that. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Father, thank you for the holy, infallible, and errant word of God. Thank you that we are reminded over and over about you and your goodness. Thank you that the word of God reminds us about us as well. And now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and that you would speak through me only the words that you would want spoken this morning. I pray that the Word of God will go out in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit and find itself uh, in our hearts to change us and make us more like Jesus. We thank you in your name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> you ever noticed how repetitious Scripture is sometimes? Uh, you'll read it here. You'll read it there. And... and uh, I remember when I was running from the call, of pre call to preach, God called me to preach, and uh, now I've got to remember, it's been so long ago, 19, in the fall of 1984, and between the fall of 1984 and June uh, 16th of 1985, 
Anywhere that I looked in Scripture, God was calling me to preach. Uh, it didn't matter if I was in Genesis or Revelation or anywhere in between. God spoke to me through Scripture saying, Son, I, I want you to preach. And uh, so uh, that's how the Word of God is. And uh, I, I'm thankful uh, for the Word of God. So uh, here in this text, uh, Jesus wants to remind us that He knows. He wants you to be reminded that He knows you. Inside and out, up and down, back and forth, from the, your beginning to your end, He knows you. A lot of times we get sidetracked and we try to uh, uh, impress this one or that one or uh, what will this person think or what will that person think or if I did this, what, what would be the outcome as far as relational uh, standpoint with this person or that point person. Uh, may I remind each and every one of us, it only matters what Jesus knows about us. That is all that matters. If we're living a life to please him, then friends, he's going to work everything else out. Amen? Y'all believe that? We need to be reminded once in a while that He knows. He knows you, and He knows me. He knows when we lay down. He knows what, when we get up. He knows what goes on when the lights are on and when the lights are off. He knows what happens uh, whenever you go to the living room, bathroom, bedroom. No matter where you are, He knows what we're doing. Amen? He knows what we're thinking. So there's three things I'd like to share with you about Jesus knows this morning. Uh, get us caught up. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been in the house of God. Jesus had just healed this man who was blind and he was mute. He couldn't see and he couldn't speak. And he also cast out a devil out of this man. Now, the result of this happening in church should have brought what, church? Should it have brought about rejoicing? And I mean, people shouldn't have been able to sit down. And there shouldn't have been a dry eye in the house. Uh, people should have been rejoicing at what God was doing in their midst. Amen? But because Jesus didn't do it the way they thought it should be done, and because he stole their thunder, they got arrogant, they got mad, and they started uh, thinking wrongly about what Jesus had done. Amen? Uh, they started thinking within themselves, well, this guy's a devil. He didn't do that right. I looked in the rabbi's handbook at page 678, and he didn't do that right. So he must be doing it according to the devil instead of how God would do it. And the, so Scripture tells us in verse 25, Jesus knew what they were thinking. You think that brought a smile on his face? You think it brought out anger? in him what do you think it's okay to answer you think he was smiling whenever he, he knew what they were thinking no he wasn't because he starts uh, this is going to be a few weeks in the making the next, next, uh, the, the next several uh, uh, verses is going to take several weeks for us to get through so just want to warn you uh, in advance because if you've been a Christian any length of time, I'm sure you've wondered, have I committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit at any time in my life? Okay? A lot of people don't know what blasphemy is. But Scripture, clear, Jesus clearly explains uh, in these next verses uh, what happens. I'm not preaching on blasphemy today. I'm preaching about Jesus knows. He knew what they was thinking. This morning... On Valentine's Sunday, February 14th, 2021, he knows what we're thinking. Regardless if we're sitting in the church building, regardless if we're at home, if we're driving down the road, he knows what you're thinking. Well, I've got to tune in uh, to Emmanuel because if I don't tune in, then I'm going to feel guilty because I didn't make a church service. But, man, I can't wait to get to the next McDonald's where I can get me something to eat. Or some of us may have our mind way over here in the cornfield somewhere, right? Maybe shopping, maybe hunting or fishing. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what you're thinking whenever, man, I wish he'd hurry and shut up where I can get out the door. 
Amen? He knows, I don't. But I could tell by the expression on your face. Uh, you that have not been coming here long, just know I've been in the ministry for a long time, and I know when it gets... I don't ever look at my watch if you ever pay attention, because I, I can tell by the folks in the building what time it is. Yeah. The five minutes till 12, it's the casual... At five after twelve, it's <sighs> at twelve fifteen. It's not so subtle. At twelve thirty, it's the watch off. <laughs> so I, I can tell you. Now, you folks watching the internet, you don't have that luxury. But I don't know. Whenever you just go, <laughs> he's done, honey. He's done. No matter what Jesus did, the scribes and Pharisees refused to acknowledge him as Savior and Lord. One of the most mighty miracles that he did was whenever he cast out demons. He healed the sick in front of them. He cast out demons in front of them. He raised the dead in front of them, yet they refused to acknowledge him as Savior and Lord. If you want to look around, if you're not a Christian, he is demonstrating who he is right in very front of you. Will you acknowledge him today? My brother, my sister, I want to let you know Jesus is active and at work all around you. Will you acknowledge him today? Will you step forward and follow him closer today than you've ever followed him? He's worthy. For us to follow as close as we possibly can get unto him. They uh, refused to acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. They came up with excuse after excuse on why they did not follow him. I've seen on social media excuse after excuse. Why, they, why folks refuse to follow Jesus. I see excuse after excuse on why people fail to uh, assemble together. And Jesus knows everything that there is to know. Here in this text, we see the extent of their refusal led them to accuse Jesus of being one of Satan's subjects. The Lord of the Flies is what Beelzebub means. He was the God of the Ekronites that is found in 2 Kings 1 and 2. So constant refusal of Holy Spirit's convicting causes a person's heart to become harder and harder until they reach a point that they will not believe no matter what. This is the point that, the, that Jesus' accusers had reached here in this very text. And we will look at this in the next couple of weeks. But today I want, to, uh, want us to focus on Jesus' omniscience. He knows all. He sees all. This is both good and bad. Right? Depends on where we are at that certain period of time. He knows all. He sees all. Whether it's something good concerning us or something bad concerning us. Again, the text is Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And said to them, Every kingdom divided, divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So three things I'd like to share with you about Jesus knows. Today I want to present to you this same Jesus, the same one that is in the text, that knows our thoughts too. He examines my thoughts and your thoughts. And whenever he examines them, what does he think about you and I. So first of all, Jesus knows our thoughts. In the case of the scribes and the Pharisees in this story, it wasn't a good thing, was it? It wasn't a good thing that he knew what they were thinking. Are we guilty as well today of thinking evil of Jesus or his church? Zechariah 8, 17, let none of you think evil in your heart against his neighbor. Wow. And do not love a false oath. For all these things, or all these are the things that I hate, says the Lord. Matthew 9, 4. 
But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Jeremiah 4.14 Jesus, uh, uh, the Bible says, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? Matthew 15, 19. Scripture says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies. Have you ever heard the phrase, follow your heart? Hmm. Mark 7, 21, for, within, uh, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, and murders. James 2, 4, it says, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and, and become judges of evil thoughts? If we're thinking evil against the disciple of Jesus, he counts it exactly the same as thinking and doing evil against himself. Did you know that? Are we harboring evil thoughts against our brothers or sisters in Christ? Here is the scripture that backs that up. How many people have ever heard of Paul? Uh, before he was Paul, his name was called Saul. And before he became the preacher of preachers, he was the persecutor of Christians. Listen to what happens when, when Paul in, has the encounter with Jesus. Acts 9, 1 through 5. Then Saul, that's Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if uh, he found any of, uh, any of who were of the way that were Christians, uh, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now, he wasn't going into the church and saying, Jesus is this or Jesus is that. He was going into these synagogues, and he was arresting Christians. So as he made his way to Damascus, at midday a bright light shone down upon him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Now he didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He said, why are you persecuting me? It's the same. He looks at it the same. If we have, are harboring evil thoughts and things against our, our, our saved brothers and sisters, Jesus takes offense to that. Verse 5, and he, that's Paul, said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Right? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. The goad's a long, sharp stick that they use to herd cattle. Jesus said, you kick against one of them a few times, your foot's going to get sore. That's what you're doing. You are persecuting me. He knows our thoughts. He knows when they're bad. But he also knows our thoughts when they are right and pure also. Aren't you glad of that? Scripture says in, in Psalm 24, 3 through 5, Who may ascend to the hell of the Lord? The psalmist said. He asked a question. Or who may stand in his holy place? Verse 4, he answers the question. He who has clean hands and what? A pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from what? A pure heart from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. 1 Peter 1.22 Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Wow. He knows our, he knows our thoughts, whether they're good or whether they're wrong. 
If we are serving Jesus with a pure heart, he knows the good thoughts that motivate us. Second of all, he knows our motives. He knows our heart, now he knows our motives. He knows why you're doing what you're doing. He rightly knows why we're doing what we do. It's far above my or your pay grade to know this. Amen? That is why the scribes and one of the reasons the scribes and Pharisees got in so much trouble. They tried to uh, figure out Jesus' motives behind what he was doing. He, they said, he, he's only driving out devils. I mean, it was apparent because it was right in front of them that the devil was cast out, right? Then they started to deduct what his intent was by doing what he did. Have you ever done that? Are we guilty of judging the intent of somebody whenever they, they're doing whatever they do? We, see, we try to figure out or think that we know why a person is doing or not doing. Only he knows the intent of her heart, Right? You can make the mightiest blunder that's ever been, but if you're doing it for the right reason, what do you think Jesus thinks? Right? Take the life of Simon Peter for an example. Peter being the spokesman of the disciples, Jesus knew the intent of his heart. Right? Think about whenever he got out of the boat. Did Jesus let him walk on water? Or did he immediately... Yeah. He knew, Jesus, if that's you, I want to come to where you are. Well, come on, Peter. He knew the intent of Peter's heart. Amen? And he's also there to save him when he did make a blunder. Seemingly, we find ourselves being a judge of someone else whenever we think that we know their motives, when in fact we really don't. Unless it's made evident by their actions or they simply tell us why they're doing what they do, we don't know. But Jesus is not faced with that problem. He knows our motives. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for you and me? Is it? Are we trying to make a show out of what we're doing? Or do we, or do, we do what we're doing with a clean and a pure heart? Genesis 6, 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Listen to what it said. That every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He said what motivated them was evil. First Chronicles 28, 9, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him... He will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. He knows the intent of her heart. He knows why we open our Bibles to study and read. Are we doing it just because, well, we better do it? He knows whenever we pray, well, I better pray. Better get that over with. I better get to the church. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart towards you. Proverbs twenty-one twenty-seven: The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with wicked intent? Psalm 44, 20 and 21. If we had forget, forgotten the name of our, our God... Were stretched out our hands to a foreign god, would, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open in the eyes of him uh, to whom we must give an account. 
This is what Jesus said in Matthew 15. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Only what was pleasing to them was what they were worried about. Last of all, Jesus knows our every breath. He knows our every tear. He knows our every trial that we face. And he loves each and every one of us. Let me repeat that. Jesus knows our every breath. He knows our every tear. He knows our every trial that we face. Yet, he loves each and every one of us. Wow. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. How long is everlasting? Yeah, has no beginning, and it has no end. Psalm 56, 8. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Your tears has a special place with the Lord. Matthew 10.30. See, some people believe that I made this stuff up whenever I said it and not quoted it or read it straight from the book. Jesus said this, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Does he know? He knows you intimately. He knows your tears. He knows the hairs of your head. And last of all, in Daniel chapter 5, verse 23, this is what Daniel said. And you have lifted up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of this house before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines. And he's talking to a lost person whenever he's saying this. And you have drank wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see, hear, or know. Listen to what Daniel said to the evil king Belshazzar. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you, have not glorified. He holds the breath, the very breath that we have. Jesus knew that you would be watching or listening or attending this service and hearing this message and has sent Holy Spirit to you this morning to search you for uh, you to know what you may need to do so you may have that intimate relationship with him that you are created for. Are you a Christian? If not, Holy Spirit is beckoning you today to be born again into his family. Holy Spirit, or Scripture says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The more times you refuse... His beckoning, the harder your heart will become. The more times you refuse Him bidding you to enter His family, the harder your heart will become. Take Pharaoh down in, in Exodus. First time Moses went to him and said, Hey, let my people go. Scripture says Pharaoh hardened his heart. No, I'm not going to let him go. These, uh, Moses was speaking under the inspiration of what God had told him. And Pharaoh said no. Moses went back to him time after time and gave him the invitation. Hey, after every plague, 
God was showing his might and his wonders, wooing and bidding Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Hey, I'm up here. I am the God of the universe. Look to me. And Scripture says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. You know what happened by around plague, I can't remember, but we'll say plague 10? God hardened Pharaoh's heart that it was impossible for him to believe. He gave him opportunity after opportunity to come and be a part of his family, but Pharaoh said, nope, don't want any of it. Got plenty of gods here in my house, don't need you. Today, you and I are made no different. Same Holy Spirit. Hey, be a part of my family. Let me wash you in the blood of Jesus. And you can be become born again. If you're here, if you're listening or watching or you're here and you, you don't have that intimate relationship with Christ, then today, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. God has appointed this very time because it's no accident that you're watching or listening or that you may be in the building. Now, today is the day that an invitation has been sent specially for you. Will you receive this invitation? My brother or sister in Christ, Holy Spirit's whispering to you, hey, move up closer. I know your thoughts. I know what you're thinking. I know the intent of your heart. And I know what you're going through. And I love you. And I want to make you a little more like Jesus than you were when you got here. Will you receive this invitation as well? Because he knows. Amen. He holds the very breath that we have in his hand. Right? He knows when one day we're going to make our last step. We're going to take our last breath. He knows that. And I want to be more like Jesus when I take my last breath than what I was before. How about you? Whatever it might be in your life that you need to get rid of or take upon, then why not do it today? Please stand to your feet. Lord, it's been an a interesting day so far. Thank you that you remind us over and over in Scripture that you are the God of the ages. There is nothing hidden before you. Whether it be good, bad, or ugly, you know all together. And you know what's going on in each one of our lives. You know if we've been born again or if we're still lost, undone, without a Savior. But I do know this, Jesus, that each person, whether they be saved or lost, it is your good will that each of us are made closer to you than what we were. If we're not moving forward, we're moving back. So, Father, help us to take this opportunity and move closer to the cross of Christ. Lord, if there's any, tr uh, any uh, burdens or cares... In the lives of these, my brothers or sisters that are here in the building, when the invitation is given, I pray that they would take a step of faith and move and, and give to you, Father, whatever it is that they need to. For my, my precious folks that are watching online this morning, you know them as well. If there's anyone that needs to become a Christian, I pray, Father, that they will receive you by faith. If there's anyone that is carrying heavy burdens this morning, that they can know that they can tell you anything and everything because you already know. Uh, let them have the faith that they can cast all their cares on you because you truly care for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Santa, you and Tommy, you want to come on and give us a hymn of invitation, folks? You, you don't even have to wait for us to sing the first song or first word of the first song. Uh, if you have a need this morning, whatever it might be, May I encourage you to take a leap of faith. Let Jesus make you more like him right now than what you were when you came in the building. If you have a word of praise because Jesus knows you, then uh, I may I encourage you to do that as well. 
How long has it been since you praised the Lord for being good to you? Uh, so whatever your need might be, uh, friend, during this invitation, this invitation is for you. Never be an invitation like this ever again. February 14th, 2021, a special invitation has been delivered to you. How will you respond this morning?